and this privilege in your word. We ask that you, you open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, and uh, cause our hearts to be receptive to this life-transforming uh, power that is in your word today, Lord. We are so thankful for your atmosphere in this place this morning. And we thank you, Lord, that this miracle is about to take place. Miracles of healing, yes. miracles of Amen. deliverance. Yes, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you that people are being set free Amen. right now in the name Amen. of Jesus. Amen. We thank you that as your word is penetrating in the hearts of the people, that circumstances and situations will be turned around. Amen. Everything that is not of you that has been planted in their lives, let it be uprooted. Yes. this day in the name Amen. of Jesus Amen. and we loose the anointing of the Holy Spirit on each and every person to remove every burden and to destroy every yoke. Yes. We say thank you Father for meeting the needs of each and every person under the sound of my voice today and I thank you Lord that you are perfecting that which is concerning them even right now and as your word is coming forth this morning we receive it by faith and we know that the power that is present in your word is coming to turn around every negative situation. We yes, thank Lord you that Lord. this is our day of victory and yes. we give you the Lord. praise, the glory and all the honor in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. With thanksgiving we have prayed. Amen. 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 Praise God. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Well, it's good to see you all again. Praise God. Amen. It's wonderful to see you in the house of God. So many things happen in the presence of God. You know, we thank God for his goodness, his mercy that surrounds us. His, he says his favor surrounds us every day. Amen. You know, I, I, I always love to meditate on Psalm 103. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. You know, it's not just saying it or reciting it, but really bless the Lord. And not don't forget any of his benefits. The Bible tells us that daily he loads us with benefits. And in Psalm 103, lists out all the benefits that he loads us with. Amen. He forgives all our sins and iniquities. He, he delivers us. He redeems us. Amen. He renews our youth. I mean, the benefits go on and on and on. And so I want to encourage you today that if you have a discouraged heart or you've been dealing with some type of situation that has caused hopelessness in your life today or brought discouragement to you today, you know, give it to God. He is the perfecter of all that concerns us. He is the meter of all of our needs. There's nothing that you and I will ever desire or ever want in this world that God cannot give us. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God his way of doing and being right. And all these things that you need shall be added unto you. Amen? Amen. And so God adds and God adds and God adds. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And so today we want to continue in our message of have faith in God. Hallelujah. Amen. And this is part two. Last week, just to do a quick recap, talked about how Adam and Eve were in the garden and they sinned. You know, they fell and when they fell, they began to, you know, see they, they ate of the tree. We know that story. And when they came out of there, when God came out to look for them, he called to Adam and he said, where are you? He's, Adam says to God, well, I was afraid, so I was hiding and because I was naked. And the Lord said, who told you that you are naked? Well, the, the moral of that story or the, the point to that account was that Adam was saying something that God did not say. Adam was speaking a language that God did not teach him. Amen? Amen? And so it's important for you and I to say the same thing as God says if we want to see a manifestation of his word in our lives. And so we pick up here in chapter 2, or, uh, or not chapter 2, but Mark eleven twenty two, where Jesus is speaking to his disciples. In Mark eleven twenty two, he then says to the disciples, and Jesus replying said to them, have faith in God constantly. Now that's where, you know, I'm pulling from the message, have faith in God. Now we're also talking about the vision is for an appointed time. You know, a lot of times we don't understand the stages or the phases of a vision when God gives a vision. And whether it's a, a, a word that came as a rhema word to you, or whether it is a prophetic word that you have received, 
one of the things that has to be done is you will have to wage war with that word. Because once that word is released, it's not like automatically everything will just fall into place because you received a word. Amen? Mm -hmm. Things don't fall into place. You have to work at it. You have to be in prayer. You have to fight. Sometimes you even have to fast and pray to see a manifestation of that word. And so a lot of times we find that when a vision is received or when a prophetic word is received, people will sit back and, you know, expect things to happen. Sit back and sit back and waiting and waiting. And they'll even tell you that I'm waiting for the word that the Lord gave me. And then at the end of the day, when nothing happens and they're wondering, well, I thought you said, you told me that this and this and this would happen. Well, what did you do with the word in the meantime when you were waiting or when the Lord gave you you know that vision came into your room into your bedroom at night or during your sleep or whenever he gave you that vision what did he say that you should do because a lot of times we step away we hear from God and we're excited when that word is received but when that word is not manifesting in our lives we start to make plan b we begin to look at situations and circumstances or even look to others in the natural to see how can you do this for me or how can I, you know, we, we are like Adam now wanting to sow fig leaves when God did not even tell them that they needed to sow fig leaves. That everything they needed was in the Garden of Eden, but because they veered away and they listened to the voice of a stranger. You see, that's why when you receive a word, you must be in prayer. And the word is not just going to come to pass in your life just because you've received a word. Every single day, God speaks to us. Sometimes people don't hear when God is speaking. Most times, God can actually give a specific prophetic word. And I was using our example as when God spoke and said, in January, start church planting. Well, I didn't just jump in the next day and open a church. No, we had to pray that word through until we got confirmation from God to say, now on this day, begin. At this time, begin. Where, Lord? It's not just, oh, begin, and then now you go searching for places yourself. You have to ask the Lord, where are you sending me? Where is this word needed? You see what I'm saying? You don't just go anywhere and just plant a church just because, oh, there's a space open here. Let's start a church here. No, everything has to be directed by God. You understand? You know, and I was using my example. I don't want to use anybody else's example. I have so many examples to give you. When God first spoke to me about getting into, you know, the fivefold ministry, that was 1997 in July. I didn't jump the next day and begin ministering or pastoring or opening a church. It took 10 years. God had to work with me and work through some stuff in my life before he could allow me to stand behind the pulpit and to minister the word. But at that point, he then said, now it's time. Now step out. You see, so I want you to understand because sometimes you think, oh, because we've come to church, we've received this word. Oh, praise Jesus. This week, my week is going to be great because the word of God came. This week is great. And true, you take that word, but you can't just sit on it. You have to use that word as way, use it in warfare. Wage warfare with that word. Because you know what? The devil is out there listening. He's waiting for you to do something so he can snatch that word. Now, the reason why we're talking about have faith in God and the vision is for an appointed time is because everything you and I will do as believers here on this earth requires faith. The currency is faith. There's nothing you will obtain out of this word without faith. Whether it's you're believing God for healing, you need faith. Whether you're believing God for finances, you need to use your faith. Whether you're believing God for a child or a marriage, you need to use faith. Whether it's believing God for a house or a car, you need to use faith. Whether it's a job, you need to use faith. Anything outside of that, you're not going to obtain the promises of God. Are you hearing what I'm Amen. saying? And so Jesus here is teaching, well, what happened is, let's begin uh, from verse 12 real quickly. On the day following, when they had come away from Bethany, he was hungry. Now this is interesting because a lot of times people don't look at it that way. Jesus here had a need. The Bible is telling us Jesus had a need. It might surprise you all. Oh, but I thought Jesus is Jesus. But yes, he came in the natural. He came to the earth and was a, you know, he was born of a woman. So he, he was in the flesh just like you and I. 
And so he wants us to identify with him. At this point where the Bible is telling us he was hungry, not that he didn't have money to go and buy, you know, doctrine, religious doctrine will tell you, oh, Jesus was poor. No, no, Jesus was not poor. Because if you, you know, if you're poor, why do you need a treasure? You know, the first person he hired was a treasure, you know, in his ministry. He had a treasure because he needed to count money. They were giving, they were doing all that stuff, amen? And so Jesus had a need at this point. Now, this need was hunger. Now, not that he couldn't find food, but you know how it is when you desire something, you desire a certain type of food, and you're like, oh, I'm going to go to this restaurant, you know, and you're holding on to that hunger, and you get to this restaurant, and you want this food, and they tell you, oh, we're out. You know, but that's why you went specifically to that restaurant because you wanted that particular meal. And they say, oh, we don't have it today. We're out of ingredients and all that stuff. What happens to you? You get upset, right? Mm -hmm. You'll be like, really? I came all this way just because I wanted that. And they'll be like, oh, do you want anything else? No. You even are upset with the servers or the people who are serving you. No, I don't want that. That's what I came for. And you'll be leaving that place angry. Am I, am I the only one who's done that before? <laughs> no. You know? You know, I'm telling you, we do that. So here, Jesus was hungry, and he saw in a distance what he wanted to eat, which was the figs. And oh, praise Jesus, there's figs. He could have bought any other food, but he wanted figs. And so he goes, we see here he's going, and the Bible tells us in verse 13, and seeing in the distance a fig tree covered with leaves, he went to see if he could find any fruit on it. For in the fig tree, the fruit appears at the same time as the leaves. But when he came up to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the fig season had not yet come. The fig season had not yet come. Amen? Amen. And so, the Bible tells us, and he said to it. Now, normally, I just can't walk up to a person and just, if the person didn't speak to me. Other versions, actually, I think King James said he answered it. So, if he answered it, it must mean that the tree spoke to him. You see? Now, I want to tell you, you, you have to identify because you may say, oh, but that's crazy, a tree speaking to him. Let me ask you, do you have bills? Yes. Do you have debt? Yes. Doesn't it speak to you every day? Oh, yeah. Hello, I'm here. You haven't paid me. Hello, I'm a reminder, I'm due today. Isn't that what happens with bills and debt? It speaks to you even though you haven't spoken to it, and, but it's telling you, hello, I'm still here. You haven't paid me off. Hello, you know, we're due this week, right? Me and him and that one and this cousin here and that one. And sometimes you don't even want to look. You want to pass by your bills. You shove them in a drawer. But the minute you open that drawer, it's speaking to you. That's what happened to the tree. It was speaking to Jesus. And he was upset because he had walked all this way to get a fig. That's what he wanted to eat. He had a need. And he finds that this tree is fruitless. And he's like, Really? You appear to be fruitful, but you're fruitless. You see what he's saying? And so he then tells it, he speaks to the tree. No one ever again shall eat fruit from you. Now, I, I suppose Jesus was upset. You know, I don't want to use the word angry, but I suppose he was upset. Okay? He was upset because he didn't find what he wanted. When you have a need, sometimes you can be upset. And, you know, but you have to direct your anger to the right person, which is the devil. Amen? Don't direct it at everybody else. And I know, the reason why I say I know Jesus was upset, because now then he went into the temple, and he began to drive out all these people. Remember, he still had a need from the beginning. And so, we go past that. Let's jump into, you know, um, verse 20. Verse 20 says, oh, let, verse 19, And when eve, the evening had come on, now remember it was morning, when he was leaving Bethany and they were going towards Jerusalem. And then when they, are, when they stopped, it was still morning, you know, spoke to the tree and then he continued his journey. Got to the temple and he started to teach and you know, all that stuff he taught. Now evening has come. He's been having this meeting all day long. Then now evening comes on, he and his, his disciples, as accustomed, went out of the city. So which means they left Jerusalem and they were walking back out towards Bethany. Amen? Amen. And so now we're told in the morning when they were passing along, so they're using the same route to go now back to where the, um, you know, where they were going to, to the temple. And in the morning, 
when they were passing along, they noticed that the fig tree was withered completely away to its roots. So this is 24 hours later. The fig tree had withered away to its root. And I like this part. And Peter remembered. And Peter remembered. Underline that if it's not underlined. You see, the fig tree withered away. What is that telling, is that telling us? Jesus spoke to it. He is the word. The Bible tells us Jesus is the word. He spoke the word. He released words out of his mouth to speak to this tree. And the tree obeyed him. The tree withered from the root 24 hours later. Amen? Amen. And so when you and I take that word, remember why God spoke to Adam and said, who told you? Because he never told him he was naked. So when you take the word of God and put it in your mouth and speak it out of your mouth, so, and you speak to situations, they must obey you. So if Amen. a tree could obey and wither to the root, that means you could speak to your bills and your bills can be paid or canceled. Amen. It means you can speak to your body and your body can line up with the word of God and be healed. You can speak to that pain and command it to go. Don't sit around with pain all week long waiting for service on Sunday. Speak to it. Begin to speak to your body. Tell it to line up in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 And so here we see that the tree, the fig tree, withered all the way to the root and Peter remembered. I think this is where most of us need to camp for a while. And he remembered. What did he remember? He remembered the words that Jesus had spoken out of his mouth to the fig tree. And then he said, look, the fig tree which you doomed has withered away. He remembered the exact words Jesus spoke to the tree. Do you remember the words God told you when he gave you that vision or that prophetic word? Do you remember that? Because it's important when you get to certain phases or junctures in your life, you need to remember, what did God say? You see, you may be moving along and doing everything and think that, okay, things are going well and whatever, but you must remember. Yes, last week I shared with you all the story of how God moved us from the East Coast to here in Texas. And in these seven years that we've been here in Texas, it hasn't been like, oh, we're just here because God brought us to Texas and we're doing our own thing. We forget why he brought us here. No, at each juncture, we're stopping and asking the Lord, Lord, do we, what do we do now? Do we move this way? Do we do that? Lord, where do we go now? What do we, who do we minister to? What do you want us to minister to? When, how? You ask those questions. You don't veer away and start having plan B. Because you see, he's the one that called you. He's the one that's given you that assignment. Amen? Amen? He's the one that's given you that prophetic word in your life. You know, so even if it's a personal prophetic word, you still wage war with it. You pray it through. Every day, you, you have to write it down. Don't just keep it in your head. Write it down so you can look at it. And, and you spend time meditating and asking the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what are the next steps. Inquiring of the Lord. Amen? Asking the Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do now? Lord, where would you have me to go? I'm always, you know, I, I love the story of David when he had come from Ziklag fighting with all the men. And, you know, the battle, well, prior to going there, he had fought these ites who were coming after him. And he wanted to ask, he asked the Lord, Lord, should I go after these people? And the Lord said, yes, go after them. You know, but and he went after them and he won. Then the second time they come back again and he says, Lord, the same group of people. And he says, Lord, should I go out against them? He could have easily gone back after them to say, well, last time when this happened, God gave, told me to do this and I'm doing this. I'm using the same strategy that he gave me the last time. But no, he didn't do that. You see what I'm saying? He didn't do that. He has a different strategy. You see, it's very important that you understand this step. Because this is where a lot of us miss it. We veer off the plans of God. You know, we had a church in Maryland. But, you know, I sat there and I said, Lord, this is a different thing. You know, you told us to shut that down. Here we are. It's a different thing. What would you have us to do? We spent from January all the way through to August praying. All the way through until September when now the Lord said, now begin. 
all the way up until last week and we're still praying, Lord, what would you have us to do? So we don't just make decisions and make decisions lightly. Where would you have us to go, Lord? What would you have us to pray? Even the word that I'm bringing, I don't just bring a word, oh, just because I want to make people happy. No, I'm not a people pleaser. I'm a God pleaser. What would you have me minister to the people? What do they need? He knows exactly what you need. I may not know your needs, but he knows what you all need. Amen? Amen. And so it's always good, even when you're going along and things seem like they're going great, to remember, like Peter remembered what Jesus said. So you've got to remember, what did the Lord say? That's why it's important to write it down. Write it down so that you don't say, oh, I think at one time, no, write it down, even the date and the time that you received that word. Even if it's a prophetic word you receive while you're sitting in church, write it down. When you know, oh, that's my word. I've been praying and this is God answering me. Write it down. Lord, on this day you gave me this answer. This is the verse you gave me. And sometimes you may not unfold everything, the entire plan in your face right now. But he will unfold it as you step out in obedience to do what he wants you to do. But in order for you to step out in obedience, you must have faith. Amen. Because everything that you and I do depends on the faith that we have. We see it throughout the Bible that everybody who obtained the promise of God was doing it by faith. Amen? Amen. So when God gives you that word and when you speak God's word out of your mouth, you don't have to wait to see something happen. This is what happened here with Jesus. You don't have to stand there and wait and see something happen. You should know that when you stand in front of your bills and you tell your bills to be paid in full, whenever you open your mouth, things are taking place behind the scenes. Things are taking place in the atmosphere. Things are taking place in the spirit realm. That's why it's important for you to say what God said only. Not what you are saying or what somebody else said. Speak the word of God only. Amen. You see what I'm saying? That's why God asked Adam, who told you that you're naked? Because God never told him he was naked. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Where is he getting that from? When you stand there and say, oh, I'm sick. Who told you that you are sick? Because God, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, never called you sick. Who called you defeated? God has never called you defeated. If everything, in anything, it's always victory, victory, your outcome is always victorious. So why are you calling yourself defeated? Why are you calling yourself depressed or discouraged? Because you see, that's the voice of the enemy. So you have to be mindful. Whose voice will you line up with? Are you lining up with the voice of God or are you lining up yourself with the voice of a stranger, the voice of the enemy? Who told you that you can't be successful? Oh, because, you know, they say that, you know, because I don't have enough education. Who said that? Did God say that? Because you don't have enough education, you can't be successful? God's success or kingdom success is not dependent on worldly, you know, education. You don't have to have, I mean, it's great if you get it, if you can, but you, God does not depend on your degrees from the world to use you in the kingdom. He can use you whether you have a degree or not, or whether you went to school, you know, um, for two years in grade, you know, kindergarten and first grade, and that's it. God can use you. He's not dependent on that. He's not dependent on the world. But we want you to go to school. If you have the opportunity, you know, and you can go to school and get educated, great. And if that's the, 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 the path that God has ordained for you, great. But don't sit here, you know, feeling like, oh, I'm so inferior because others, you know, are all educated and I'm not. Maybe that's not the path God carved out for your life. Have you ever asked him, your maker, what he created and intended for your life? Why are you making your own decisions? Ask him, hear from him, pray through it. Amen? Amen. And so here we see that, you know, Peter remembered. And so what I'm trying to show you here is you might not see the manifestation today when you speak to your body or you speak to your, you know, to your bills or anything, those negative circumstances, speak to your marriage, speak over your children. You might not see the manifestation of that thing which you spoke out of your mouth manifest today, tomorrow, next week, or even next year. But if you keep at it, if you keep at it, things are working behind the scenes. Amen? Amen? It happened. All you have to know is it happened the moment you spoke it out of your mouth. Amen. 
Just like Jesus, when he spoke to that fig tree, it happened as soon as he spoke. The, the tree didn't wither. You know, Peter remembered the words, but it didn't wither 24 hours later. It withered immediately Jesus was done speaking to it. But you just didn't see the manifestation until 24 hours later. And so when you take the word of God and you speak it over yourself and you speak it over yourself, you may not see a manifestation at that particular moment, but know that the minute you say amen, you're done speaking that word over yourself. Things are already happening behind the scenes. Amen? Amen. So the moment I speak the word out of my mouth, immediately, I like the Bible because it has it uses words like immediately and suddenly and presently, things are already happening. Amen. 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 Things are happening in the atmosphere to cause what I say come to pass. Amen. Amen. So what are you saying out of your mouth? What have you said about yourself today? What have you said about your future? Because God has a different future for you, one where he wants you to prosper. He wants you to be in health, even as your soul prospers. He says, I have a good plan for your life, one that will cause you prosperity. You see, he says, I'm the Lord, your God, your Redeemer, the one who teaches you to profit. So in your life, God is seeing you profiting. God is seeing you successful. But what are you seeing yourself? What are you calling yourself? What have you said about yourself lately? What did you say about yourself? What did you say about that situation? Oh, this thing, it's not working. And yet God has already called it working. God has already called it successful. And you are going to put your two cents on it. And you're going to say, oh, it's not working. To cancel out what God is saying. Oh, Father, forgive us. We need to repent. Amen. Amen. And so faith is vital to our walk as Christians. And these are just basics, but I'm just going to give it to you real quickly. This, you know, we're told in Habakkuk 2, 4, Romans 1, 17, Galatians 3, 11, and Hebrews 10, 38, that we are required to live by faith. So as believers, we live by faith. Faith is our currency. We cannot live by what we see or the circumstances or by what we hear. We live by faith. The Bible also says that, you know, the just, it says the just shall live by faith. So you and I are the just. Jesus has made us righteous. He's justified us. And therefore, we cannot exist without faith. If the just shall live by faith, then the just, they, without faith, they can't live, which means they die. And so the just shall live. If you want to live, it is by faith. Amen? Amen. Salvation is impossible without faith. You'll find that in Ephesians 2.8. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us we also walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 1, 24 lets us know we stand by faith. You know, in Ephesians, Apostle Paul says, when you've done all, to, when you've done all you know to stand, stand. How do you stand? Well, you stand by faith. 2 Corinthians 1, 24. The Bible also tells us in 1 Peter 1, 5 that we are kept by faith. Hebrews 11, 32 to 34 lets us know that Christianity is absolutely worthless without faith. Hebrews eleven six 6 tells us that you cannot connect with God except through faith. In Matthew 9, 27 through 29, we see that healing comes by faith. In 1 John 5, 4, we are told that we overcome by faith. In Ephesians 6, 16, we are told that faith is a winning weapon in the battles of life. If you want to win any battle, you must use your faith. Carry your shield of faith. Hebrews 11, 1, through 3, uh, 1 to 3, and then verse 6, it tells us that faith is the main ingredient that we need to obtain the promises of God. Faith is the title deed. Amen? Amen. Amen. It also, and it also tells us that faith is now. Faith is never in the future. Faith is always now. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 11, 6 tells us that nothing works in the kingdom of God without faith. Mark eleven twenty three 23 tells us that faith moves mountains. So if you have a mountain in your life, whether it's a mountain of debt or a mountain of problems, it can only be removed by faith. Amen. Hebrews 11, 1 is, is the master key that opens all the doors in the kingdom of God. You will not be able to open any door in the kingdom of God without faith. You use faith. 
In, G, in, in Matthew 17, 20, Jesus said that if you have faith inside you, no bigger than the side of, size of a small mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move away from here and go over there and you will see it move. So there's nothing, basically he said, there's nothing that you couldn't do if you had faith. There's nothing that will be beyond your power if you have faith. And nothing will be impossible to you if you have faith. Faith. Amen. So faith is the answer for everything in the kingdom of God. Amen. 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 And that's why in Mark 9, 23, Jesus said, you know, when the man with the demoniac child came to him and said, Lord, if you can do anything, you know, have mercy on me. And Jesus says, what do you mean if? If, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. It's not a question of if. It's, it's, you know, it's, not a, it's never a question of do I have faith? It's a question of do I, what am I doing with the faith that I have? You see, how do I know? Because in Romans 12, 3, the Bible tells us that each of us has, you know, has been accorded faith to the degree. It says each according to the degree of faith apportioned to him by God. It talks about don't be prideful or high-minded thinking of yourself highly, but we ought to be sober each you know, according, you know, we should we should belittle ourselves each according to the degree of faith apportioned to him by God. So you and I, we all start out with faith. In King James, it talks about the measure of faith. So when you get born again, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, we all start out with the measure of faith, the same measure of faith that we start out with. But then why is it some people can use their faith and believe God for mountains to move and some cannot believe God for anything to happen in their lives? They believe, they've fasted, they've rolled all over the floor, they've done this, done that, cast the devil out, you know, spent time, you know, um, speaking to demons and doing all that stuff, but yet still nothing is happening. Why is it there's a difference? Well, I want to tell you, according to the word of God, he said that each according to the decree, degree of faith, apportioned to him. Amen? Amen? Each according to the degree of faith, apportioned to him by God. So it's never a question of, do I have faith for this? Sometimes people say, oh, apostle, pray for my faith. Uh, no, you can't pray for somebody's faith. Each one at the beginning, we all have received the measure of faith. Pray for my faith. What do you mean, pray for my faith? You know, some people get offended when you ask that. What do you mean, pray for my faith? Because there's nothing there in the Bible that says, pray for your faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God. Now, let's go back to the degrees. Amen. Because faith in de is in degrees, and we all have varying degrees or varying levels of faith. And it's important to understand that. Because not everybody is on the same level of faith. Are you hearing what I'm Amen. saying? Amen. So something that for me, I find is not challenging. When I see it, I'm like, oh yes, I can do this. I can believe God for this. Might be challenging for somebody else who's not on my level spiritually. Now, I'm not talking in terms of fivefold ministry, like in the office of apostle that I'm in. I'm talking as a believer, on the level of being a believer. You see, I can believe for things. I mean, I've believed for, I've prayed for people over email and believed for cancer to leave their bodies, and cancer has left their bodies without me ever laying hands on them, Amen. without me ever touching them, without me ever meeting them. We have a testimony of a family. We've got so, several testimonies through our ministry, but we have a family in Boston. They, they called me through my armor bearer in Florida and said, you know, my armor bearer called me one Saturday morning. This is when we're back in the, over on the, on the East Coast. I think it was either 2010 or something, 9 or 10. And my armor bearer calls me super early in the morning and says, woman of God, I have a friend. Her husband was sick yesterday when they rushed him to the hospital. And now the, the, the hospital has said that he has a brain tumor, or not a brain tumor, he had brain damage and he's brain dead. And right now there's nothing they can do for him and all that stuff. So I said, what happened? He says, no, they were just home watching TV in the evening after dinner and he started throwing up and throwing up and so they rushed him to the hospital and when they got him to the nearest hospital, they said, oh no, this case is too big for us. So they had to airlift him to a, to a bigger hospital in Boston. 
And when they airlifted him there, you know, now the wife was crying. And you know how it is, you know, calling people back home and people now start putting you in a grave before you're even in a grave. You know, that's why you have to know who you can connect with when situations like that arise. Who can you stand, who can stand with you? Not everybody can stand with you because their level of faith may not be there. And so here it is, you're telling people back home, oh, you know, this is what's happening. Then they start having a funeral before the person has died. Because based on what you're reporting every hour, oh, this is what the doctor said. And sometimes I tell people, don't tell the people back home anything until you see what God does. And so this, this gentleman and the wife, the gentleman is the one who was sick. So the following morning, my armor bearer says, please, woman of God. So I called them, maybe around 8 a.m., and I called her. I've n I'd never met her before, never met them before. So I said, what's going on? So she comes on the phone, and she'll tell you, too. She comes on the phone, and she's crying and crying. The first thing I said is, shut up. You know, back then I was so bold, you know. <laughs> you know, people are like, Apostle, where did that apostle go? She's grown. <laughs> you know, but I was like, shut up. And she was crying. I said, I can't even talk to you. You're just crying. Why are you crying? And she says, oh, because the doctor. I said, don't worry about the doctor. I said, what's going on? So she explains to me. I said, okay. I said, where's your husband now? Where are you? She says, I'm at the hospital. I said, okay, I want you to lay hands on him. And I'm going to pray for him. At this point, they declared him dead brain dead you know he would, even if he came out he was be he'll be a vegetable he'll never walk what 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 he's on life support all this nonsense it's not nonsense but i'm just saying for when it comes to the word of god god is like there's power bigger than what is in the world Amen. thank god for the medical professionals but they are they're limited in what they can do for us that's why you have to know god so anyhow, in this account with this family, so the, the, um, I, start, I said, okay, if I'm going to pray with you, you cannot, after my prayer, say anything negative about your husband. You cannot call your family back home and inform them. When you do phone them and they ask you what is going on, say he's healed in Jesus' name. Are we on the same page? Are we together? She said, yes. I began to pray over him on the phone and I prayed over him on the phone. You know, I prayed with her, not too, too long. I declared the word of God, and I was done. And I said, what did I say? She said, I said, no more crying. I, why are you crying? Is there a funeral? No, ma'am. I said, then don't cry. I said, your husband is healed. Let God do what he has to do. And so at that point, I said, do you have an iPod or something? That's when iPods were thing, when things were you know, coming out. I said, do you have like an iPod or a uh, CD player there? Because I'm going to email you my healing confessions. And I want you to play it throughout. Let him hear it. Even if you get earphones, let him hear the word, the word, the word. Don't speak anything negative to him. Don't let him hear anything negative. Because I know that people, when they're in a coma, they can hear. Because I've had situations where I've prayed with people who were in a coma or considered brain dead, and they've been alive after I've prayed for them, and they've come and told me, I heard what you said when you were praying. But yet the doctor said they were brain dead. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. And so I know that they can hear. So I said, just put earplugs in there, you know, earphones or, or whatever. Let them just hear the word and hear the word. Because sometimes people are not sensitive. They'll start talking or even people visiting, they come and they look at you. You know, when you have visitors who show up that, as if they're showing up to your funeral, kick them out. Mm -hmm. Uh-uh, you don't need that. You don't want people in your room acting like they're coming to kill you. No, because you are believing God for something. Are you hearing what Amen. I'm saying? Because you see the people like that, your faith will just dissipate. And so here it is, we have this gentleman and this wife, you know, and I've never met them at this point. And so she was like, well, maybe let me call my sister-in-law. So the sister-in-law calls me. I said, okay, I'm going to email you. And I don't know how it happened that day, but I was able to download and email everything to her. And she ran out and got an iPod. They downloaded the, my, my healing confessions and everything to this iPod. And they took it in to see the gentleman. Well, long story short, later on they came to my conference when I was in Boston. Now, I would never really sat down and talked to them about what, you know, when did he come out. All I know is the doctor said he would never walk. And they certified he would never walk. And even if he comes out, he'll be a vegetable. He has to be in a nursing home the rest of his life. And so you might as well just pull the plug. But I told her, I said, no, God will do what he said he will do. And so they came out. And when we had our conference, they came and the husband came and they testified. But last year when we were in Boston, she said, oh, woman of God, do you know how long? I said, did it take like a month or a week? She said, no. Three days after you had prayed, three days, the man was back in 
full form. The doctors couldn't find anything wrong with him. He walked out of that hospital, never had to go to a nursing home, never had to go to rehab. What are you telling me? You mean to tell me the word doesn't work? It works. You see, but her faith was not at a level where she could produce that. So when she connected with my faith, Okay, and I'm on, I was already on this level high up here where I've seen God do miracles. I've seen God heal people of brain tumors when the doctors are saying they won't live past midnight. And it's 6 p.m. and I lay my hands on that person and the power of God hits them and God heals them. And now they're healed. They had brain tumor, they had HIV, but no more HIV, no more brain tumor. What are you going to tell me in this place? That the word of God doesn't work? No, it works. But you must. Apply your faith. Mm -hmm. Amen. When you have prayer failure, it's because you have faith failure. Yes. You're not using your faith to believe God. In this kingdom of God, we use faith. That's our currency. Amen. Oh, yes. Last year, she tells me, it was three days, woman of God. We're trying to get them, figure it out where we can get them on tape. You know, we've got a lot of testimonies where we haven't videotaped the people who give testimonies and things that have happened to them in their life. Another lady was hit by a bus, family friend of ours. The day that happened, the Lord said, no, don't go there. Remember, I said, you have to hear from God. Mm -hmm. Family, friends. And the Lord said, no, don't go. And I'm thinking, wow, this is going to look bad because all our friends know, you know, that I'm in healing ministry. But the Lord said, no, stay. And I stayed. My mother will testify. Three months, I couldn't go there. After, But in all that time, the doctors were doing this, this. She was hit by a bus, thrown up in the air. She had brain damage, all this stuff. Put her on life support. When the doctors couldn't do whatever it was necessary to bring her back, they told the family, she is dying. You know, we just have to pull the plug. There's nothing more we can do. She's never going to come out of this coma and all that stuff. Well, when I, that one day I'm praying, the Lord said, tomorrow, you need to go pray over that lady. Now it's been three months later. I'm like, geez, Lord. So I wrote to one of the children. I said, you know, where's your aunt? I mean, I was even embarrassed to even write this email because it's been three months. I haven't set foot there. And I got an email back just with the hospital name, room number. That was it. This is a friend who would always be like, hey, how are you? This time, none of that. And I understood. I wasn't upset. I knew that they didn't understand that for me, I had to go on the instructions of the Lord. So I went and the doctors, uh, when I got there, um, she had been, she was, you know, of, of course she was brain dead at that, according to them at that time. And they had covered her with a net like a tent. You know, it looks like a tent, but it was a net. And so I'm like, Lord, how do I pray for her? The Lord said, just take your anointing or touch the, ne the, the net, the netting. And that's what I did. And I began to pray over this woman and pray over her. And I left, I found that she had a CD player and I left my CD there with healing confessions on it and healing prayer. And I went to the nurse's station. I said, I've left a CD playing. Can you keep playing it if it stops? She said, okay. And I spoke to this woman. I prayed and I was done. And I left, didn't hear anything, didn't follow up. A year later, we were, uh, my mother and I had gone to, uh, uh, her friend had lost her husband. And so there was a funeral. And so we went to the service, the church service. And after the service, when we went for refreshments, these two girls are running after me, the family friends. And they're like, oh my God, I'm glad you're here. And I said, what's going on? They said, my aunt wants to see you. I'm like, oh, your aunt? They said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure who they're talking about. So they take me to this woman who has a cane. And, you know, you could see that there was, like, something done to her head. And so she's like, and they're like, Auntie, Auntie, this is Pastor Debbie. And she's like, oh, my God, I've been wanting to meet you. And I said, oh, and I'm looking at her because I'm like, okay, I don't know who she is. And she's like, I know you don't know me. But I was in the hospital. They, the doctors were saying that I was brain dead. But you came and you prayed. And I heard you. You told me God has sent you to come and pray over me and that he has healed me and that I'm coming out. Amen. I'm here, I'm say, Amen. And I'm coming out and you left your CD prayer and I kept on hearing. I said, that was, she says, yes, that was me. And she said, the only thing is that, you know, my, my leg was hurt much more or broke, whatever. So I'm using a cane, but they said that I'll be fine, you know, but I'm going back home. But I wanted to meet you. Now, listen, I wasn't even there. I spoke what God told me, the word he gave me and behind the scenes. He's working things out. The word started to work the minute I released it out of my mouth. Amen. Amen. 
So the thing about it is, yes, I can give you all these testimonies of people in Europe sending me to, you know, uh, uh, letters to say, you know, I, the doctor diagnosed me with cancer and they say I have three weeks to live and I pray over an email and the person is healed instantaneously Amen. 24 hours later. Amen. I can share you testimonies with you of people who are in Africa who are in comas and I get a letter from another person in Africa who's saying, oh, my brother, is, they said he's in a coma, he's a vegetable. I pray over an email, the brother is released from the hospital, no Amen. more brain dead. Amen. We have somebody here who came and said, oh, my brother is having surgery next month in Zimbabwe and they said he has breast cancer and I'm giving, I'm giving you a seed apostle for you to pray over my brother and there I was, I prayed over the phone with this lady and the brother was having surgery next month, they scheduled him for surgery, when he goes that day, I even told her it's not going to happen, when he goes that day to the hospital and the doctors you know, did a scan, they ran a scan they said okay something is different and they said what do you mean, he says well the last scans are these showing that your breast had cancer, but now here, this is the scan, there's no cancer. What happened within a span of three weeks? The minute the word was released. But you see, I didn't arrive at this place just overnight. It took time. Me building up my faith in the word and praying and building up my faith. We all start out with the measure of faith. Are you hearing me? Yes. We all start out with the measure of faith, but what are you doing with your measure? Because if you're sitting with that measure, then it's, not, it's at zero level. Remember I talked about the degrees. Jesus, in Mark 440, he said to the disciples, when the wind was boisterous and he was sleeping in the boat and they came and woke him up, Master, we're perishing. They were full of fear. And Jesus asked them, why have you no faith? So there's the no faith level. The, the area where even though you have the measure of faith, but you've never done anything with your faith. You've never even believed God for someone to give you $5. You see, you can't start, you know, <laughs> I was teaching my little sister the other day, you know, the, a, a few weeks ago. Uh, she was believing God for this exorbitant amount of money. And I said, but have you ever believed God for even $100? Have you ever believed God for even someone to just give you a 1000 Not where you call somebody and say, and she was like, well, I said, no, I'm not talking about African currency. I'm talking about dollars. Have you even believed God to just wake up in the morning and have somebody just come and bless you without you having done anything for $100? Have you ever believed God where somebody can just come to you and give you 200 or 300 or 500 without you having done anything? Because you cannot, if you've never believed God for even one dollar to come into your life by somebody just walking up to you and saying, here's a blessing of one dollar. You cannot start from one, from zero to then now, I want to believe God for ten thousand dollars. Really? You pray, you pray, you fast, you cast out demons. But if your faith is not up there, you will not produce that. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. And so there's the no faith level. Then we have the little faith level. In Mark 4, Matthew 14, 28, Jesus said little faith. Then in Mark 15, Matthew 15, he talks to the Syrophoenician woman who came and he even called her a dog and she wasn't offended. And then he says, great is your faith. Great is your faith. Your faith has caused your daughter to, you see, that's what happened with great faith. She didn't have to bring her daughter to the meeting. Her daughter was laying at home. You see, it was being demon-possessed and being afflicted and oppressed by the enemy. So she couldn't even bring her from home, but she comes and tells Jesus. And Jesus calls her a dog. She's not offended. She says, even if it's a little crumb, I'll take it. And Jesus calls her faith great. And then he says, go home. Your daughter is healed. At that same moment, her daughter was healed. The demon left her because she had great faith. You understand? So if you have no faith, you can't believe for big things, but you can start somewhere. You start where you are, at the level where you are. So sometimes as believers, we want the bigger things in life and we are praying for that, but you haven't ever exercised your faith for something smaller. And so when that big thing doesn't manifest, <coughs> you're wondering, why is this not happening for me? Why do they have that? Well, because maybe their faith is greater than yours. And then we have also a level in 2 Thessalonians 1.13. It says, faith that grows exceedingly. It says, I'm happy that your faith is growing exceedingly. This is the level where you talk about, oh, my, my faith has produced miracles beyond measure. 
This is the beyond measure level of faith. Exceeding great faith. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so Romans 10, 17 tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Now, why am I explaining this to you? Why am I telling you? Because faith is the ingredient. Yes, it may seem basic to most of you. Oh, Apostle, you've taught us about faith. But you can never stop learning about faith. Because in every situation that you will encounter in this life, you need to use faith. Anytime God tells you to do something, you have to use faith. When God told me to quit my job and there was no paycheck in sight, I had to step out in faith. When God tells me to start this start, I do it in faith. You think I sit here when I start, when we started this church, did you think we sat here, started calling people, oh, you know, you know, you should come to our church. No. You know, we invited people, but we are stepping out in faith. God is giving us a big vision, so we step out in that, in that level, the level that God has given us. If your faith is small, you start small. If your faith is big, you start where God is. So my faith is not, my faith, and, I, and I'll be honest with you, my husband and I combined, our faith is exceeding great faith. Amen. But separate, if we had to do things separately, he will be the first one to tell you, my faith is stronger than his faith. Not to put him down or anything, but he'll tell you why. Because for me, this is my food. Day in and day out. I'm growing. I'm growing my faith. Because I'm, every day I'm faced with people who come with situations and circumstances and problems to me all the time. We have a couple right here. He was in the hospital. The doctors had put him on so many different things. In fact, when they were in the hospital, she calls me and she tells me the doctors had, had even sent the chaplains, two chaplains to her to pray with her because they called him dead. When she called me, I said, no, 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 no. He even, because the doctors were telling them he's not going to make it, he's telling her, call home, call my brothers. I said, no, ask her. Am I telling a lie, Mama Belt? I scolded her. I said, no. We are lining up with the word of God. I said, put your husband on the phone. He comes on the phone. I said, Baba, you are not dying. You're not going anywhere. Your youngest daughter is not married yet. You will see her walk down the aisle. You are not going anywhere. In the name of Jesus. I said, have you seen your grandchildren, all of them? He says, no. I said, then stop talking what the doctors are talking. Did I not say that to you? And I went to the hospital and I met up with him. And then the Lord said to me, you don't lay hands on him. Have her lay hands on him. Have her lay hands on you. I mean, you lay hands on her. So she laid hands on her husband because they are one. And I laid hands on her. And his kidneys had shut down. But she had no pain in her body, nothing. He was sitting there, his kidneys shut down. The doctors were like, oh, there's nothing more we can do. What, what, what? We began to pray there, and I'm putting my hand on her. I put my hand on her shoulder. The next thing, she started having back pain. And back pain, oh, boss, oh, boss. I said, just let it. God, I said, God is fixing your husband's kidneys. Just, just continue. Oh, oh, I just said, just continue. She was in pain. And then she felt the sharp pain. She was screaming. I said, don't worry. God is removing that impurity. He's moving, removing that demon. That is the spirit of death. It's coming out. And it's because you're one. It's coming through you. And God is letting you know how he's healing him. Amen. Amen. Oh, my yeah. God. Mm. He'll tell you. He was wide awake when we did that. And we pray, and that thing left. And when I said, let me know when, when the pain is gone. And she said, oh, now it's gone. And we checked him. How are you feeling? He says, oh, better. He's bright now. He's sitting up. He's hungry, all that. I'm like, you see, <laughs> instantaneously, the Bible says when you speak his word, immediately, presently, things are happening. Yes. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Here he is, walking, he'll come in here. Last week he's even telling me, Apostle me, I told her, I, mean, I went to Apostle one time, he prayed for me for my knee, and the pain's gone, and you, you're here with this pain. <laughs> you see who's become the teacher now. But there they are, in the flesh. Haven't you seen your daughter's engagement now? You see? I said, don't forget about telling people back home, oh, I'm here. I said, no, because you see, they may not have the same level of faith as you have. And so here we are, believing God. There they are pulling us down because they lack faith. If, if their faith is on the same level, 
It's fine. But if their faith is not on the same level, all you're doing is putting fear in there, and then they'll speak negative words to cancel out what we are saying. So you have to be careful who you share stuff with, even if it's family members. You understand? You've got to believe God. And you'll raise your faith by hearing the word, hearing the word, and hearing the word, being in the word. So you start small. God is not going to just come out and tell you, oh, boom. So real quickly, let's look at Abraham's life. Is this blessing somebody? Because you see, I want you to learn that as we go, we can go, you know, I can teach you deeper stuff than this. But if you don't have this foundation, you always just be coming to church and just to come to church. But you see, we are a church of results. We need to see results. I need to see results in your life. God is waiting to see results in your life. You see? And so there's, but there's a journey. That's why it's, you know, I like Abraham's life because God visited him. Now, real quickly, in Genesis 11, you'll find that Abraham's dad, Terah, is the one who God spoke to that group of people and had told them to go to the promised land. So in Genesis 11, verse 27, we begin there. And they're the ones who started off and they were going all the way. God gave them a, a, um, visited them and told them to, you know, move. In fact, Terah, Abraham's dad, he was given the vision to move his family to the land of Canaan. And so Ur of the Chaldees was a city, which we see here in the Bible, that was, um, it's in the region of Soma, south, uh, southern Mesopotamia, in what is now known as modern day Iraq. So that's where Abraham's dad and Abraham's descendants came from. So it tells us, verse 27, now this is the history of the descendants of Terah. Terah was the father of Abram, in the way they pronounce it, we say Abram, but it's Abram. The father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran was the father of Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah died in the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took wives, and the name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. But Sarai was barren, she had no child. And Terah took Abram, his son, Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, and they went forth together to go from Ur of the Chaldees into the land of Canaan. So they knew that they were now going to Ur of the, they were going towards the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Okay, so they settled in, in Haran, amen? Amen. And so when they arrived in Haran, they were supposed to just be resting, but they settled. Sometimes as believers, we settle in a place where it's supposed to be just temporary. It's supposed to be a place of rest. God wants you to gather your strength and all that, but then you settle there. You hear what I'm saying? Amen. You have to check with the Lord. Is this it's Clearly the Lord has said, go to the land of Canaan. So we know they had not arrived at the land where God was telling them to go to. So when they stopped at a pit stop somewhere just to get a break, instead of, it looked like, oh, the land is good here, let's settle. So they did not fulfill the the will of the Lord, the plan of the Lord for their lives at that particular time. Amen? Amen. And so we're told Terah lived until 205 years, and he died in Haran. So after he died, that's when we go to chapter 12, we find that God, in, the, in Haran, the Lord said to Abram, he now visits Abram in Haran. He gives him a divine visitation, or he received a divine visitation. And he was shown in a vision, an assignment from God. But I want you to understand, this assignment took over 25 years before all seven stages of the vision came to pass. Mm-hmm. And this is, I want to use this because remember I said, the vision is yet for an appointed time. Mm-hmm. You have to step out in faith to begin. God's timing is important. So you need to make sure you hear from God about timing. Whether it's even to start a business, sometimes people just start a business and start 
just because, oh, somebody else has started a business, so let me start a business too. But maybe it's not the right time for you to start that business. Maybe God just wanted you to prepare. Do you know that there are some businesses that are incubated that take about two, three years before they're even out in the public, but behind the scenes, they're working on it, they're bringing this, they're doing that. But for most of us, just because we get a business idea, we think, oh, let me just jump out and start working on this business right now. I'll get clients. When you don't have customers or clients or whatever, then the next thing you start getting depressed about it. Oh, this thing is not working. You've invested money in it. You didn't even check with God for the right time to set it up, to start out. And so now when this happens, now you've lost this money. Now you are, you've lost hope and you've shut it down. It's not going anywhere. And then now you feel, oh, I've put that thing aside. But it may have been a plan of God. You just went ahead of God. And you, you birthed an Ishmael instead of birthing an Isaac. You understand? It happens. And I'm using an analogy of business because a lot of people do that. You know, just because God has said, you know, start this. You, he may want you to do research. Have you ever heard of that? You do research, you check, you know, you, you do market research, you go around, check the area. You have to ask God, where would I, where do you want me to launch this business? Just because you're in Dallas doesn't mean your business has to be in Dallas. Who told you that he might want you to launch an online business in California or somewhere else? But no, you're so focused on, oh, because so-and-so started, and they're doing well, and I'm going to start, and it's going to do well. It might not be. That, that, that's the way God wants it for you. And so people make a lot of these mistakes based on the, and you know, you waste, you spend money that you shouldn't have spent. You see, but if God is telling you, he's given you the vision and he's told you, start your business here in Dallas. Okay, Lord, where? Don't stop. Oh, because God has said start a business in Dallas. You ask him where exactly, Lord? Where do you want me to? In North Dallas, in Fort Worth? Is it in, you know, where in Dallas? Is it in Rockwell? Whatever, you know? Dallas is huge. So you need to find out. You can't just, oh, because I'm in Melissa, let me do it in Melissa. No. You have to hear from God. You see what I mean? If it's not, because if you're positioned incorrectly, you will not see the customers and the clients. They will pass you by. While you're sitting there calling for clients to come, but they won't come. Now you will start thinking it's the devil doing something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then now, oh, ah, that thing, ah, apostle, that thing, it didn't work. What do you mean it didn't work? If God gave you the vision, it must work. Amen. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? If God is the originator of that vision or that assignment, it must work. Mm -hmm. There's no two ways about it. God will not give you a vision or an assignment, and it doesn't work. The only reason that it wouldn't work is if it was your own vision or your own assignment, you sent yourself. Is the truth all right in this way? Amen. Because when God sends you, it works. Always, it works. Even if it's business, even whatever it is, if it's God, that's why even with my singles, I tell them all the time, if God sends you that man, ladies, it's going to work. But if it's not working, you've married and two, three months down the line it's not working, maybe God's hand is not in it. Maybe you sent that man to yourself or you plucked him out of the tree. You see, I like how the Nigerians do it. They'll come and say, oh, we've seen a little flower in your garden and we want to pluck it. <laughs> you see? So maybe you went and plucked <laughs> when it wasn't time. It wasn't right yet. God can connect you to somebody, doesn't mean tomorrow he's your husband. Take the time to get to know the person. Because before I can tell you, he, he even asks you to marry him, you have discovered some stuff. Especially if you're praying, Holy Spirit, show me who this person is, not what they're presenting to me. You hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so anyhow, going back to Abraham. So he receives this vision. It's seven stages or seven phases. Verse, verse 12, verse, um, chapter 12, verse 2. The vision begins there. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you with abundant increase of favors, and make your name famous and distinguished, and you'll be a blessing, dispensing good to others. And I will bless those who bless you or confer prosperity or happiness upon you, and curse him who curses you, uses this and language toward you. In you will all the families and the kindred of the earth be blessed, and by you they will bless themselves. Then verse 4 we see, so Abraham... Oh, Abraham departed. 
Now God has given him and he's unfolded this seven, this seven phase destiny that he has for him. Number one, the first phase, I will make you a great nation. Mm -hmm. He didn't say make yourself. He said, I, Jehovah God, will make you a great nation. Now here, Abraham is just him, his wife, and the Bible tells us that at that point she had no child. The Bible even calls her barren. So you know what barren is? She's fruitless at that point. So here's God coming with a vision that counters what is actually manifesting or the circumstances in his life. I will make you. Amen? Amen. He says, I will make you a great nation. So he had to remember that. Remember, Peter remembered what Jesus said. And Jesus said, you know, and here God is telling Abraham, remember this. I am the one who will make you. Not you, but I will make you a great nation. Then he goes number two, phase number two. Once I make of you a great nation, I will bless you with abundant increase of favors. I, the Lord, will be the one to bless you. You don't have to bless yourself. You don't have to rob some, nobody. Mm -hmm. I will bless you. Number three, and make your name famous and distinguished. Who again will do it? I'm the one who's going to make your name famous and distinguished. You don't have to do it for yourself. You don't have to be on Facebook day in and day out trying to make yourself famous. You see, it is the truth, all right? Yeah. <laughs> Some people looked at me like, oh, Facebook. Yeah, I'm just saying, <laughs> you don't have to try to make yourself famous. I will make you famous and distinguished. This is what he promised him. Number four. The state, fourth stage, and you will be a blessing, dispensing good to others. The reason I'm doing all these first three things is so that you will be a blessing, dispensing good to others. There's a purpose for why I'm doing this in your life, Eva Brown. Then number five, he says, I will bless those who bless you, meaning those who confer prosperity and happiness upon you, those who wish you well, I will bless them. But then the next phase is, I will curse him who curses you or uses insolent language towards you. Meaning those who are rude and disrespectful and insulting and arrogant, I will curse them. Why? Because I have blessed you. So they can't curse you. Then in verse number six, it says, in you will all the families of the earth be blessed. All the families of the earth will be blessed in you. So this is God's sevenfold destiny for Abraham. Then he stepped out in faith. None of this stuff had already happened, but he ended up stepping out in faith. Are you hearing me? Mm -hmm. The Bible says, so Abram departed. I'm sure if it were up to Sarai, his wife, at that time, he, she probably would have been like, what? what are you talking about? I don't see that happening. She's looking at herself and all that. But he obeyed the voice of God. He heard and he remembered what God said. And so he departed. Amen? Amen. Now we see that in chapter 13, already things are, happen are beginning to happen. First of all, in chapter 12, there's a famine, and he went to live in Egypt temporarily. Again, it was a temporary situation. Yes. Oh, but apostle, I thought you said God said he will bless him. Why is there now a famine? Because things do happen. The enemy will set up roadblocks and obstacles to stop you and to hinder that word that God has given you from coming to pass in your life. And especially if you're just sitting on it, not doing anything, not waging war. You know, you got to pray that thing through daily. It's not something that you can just sit on and expect that, oh, by tomorrow it will happen. No, you have to pray through it. When you don't pray, that's, that's a prayer failure, faith failure, and you won't obtain anything. And so there's a famine. Well, he's not moved by that. God sends him. Sometimes, you know, sometimes certain things happen and God uses it to your advantage. Because in terms of Abraham here, there was a famine. And of course, we know that he, he told a half lie because Sarai was his half sister. And so, but when they went there, this famine forced them. Sometimes God will allow situations, circumstances, the, the natural stuff of the world to force you into a place in which you probably on your own wouldn't have gone through had it not been for that situation. So some circumstances, don't be quick to pray them away. Oh, Lord, this thing is too hard. I can't do this. God will force you to be in a place that will cause you to receive a blessing. Because we see here with Abram that when he was coming out, you know, when he came out of this place, he commanded, you know, we're told that, you know, Pharaoh saw the wife, of course, took her in, but then he didn't sleep at night. You know, he, he, the Lord scourged 
his household and all that stuff because of Abraham's wife, Sarah. God knew that he was sending them that way because he wanted to start blessing them with the blessings that he was going to be, you know, with the wealth and the riches and the abundance that God had promised him. And so he forced him to go, the famine forced him to go into the, you know, to, to Egypt. But in Egypt is where he was going to gather the wealth of the sinners. The Bible says the wealth of the sinners is being laid up for the just. Sometimes there are situations that will force you to go into a place where when you come out, you come out on top. Are you understanding? Yes. And so here, you know, she, so Abraham and his wife, verse 13 you know, he first of all, Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they brought him on his way with his wife and all that he had. You know, but they also gave him. He acquired sheep, oxen, donkeys, men servants, maid servants, she donkeys, and camels. Look at that. He acquired all this wealth, and then he went out. Verse two of chapter thirteen. It tells us that he and his wife went out, lot with them, and Abraham was extremely rich. We, he wasn't, we, did, we weren't told he was extremely rich in chapter 12 when he started out. But this situation, a temporary situation, caused him and forced him to go into this place that he had not planned. But it was part of God's plan so that when he came out of it, he came out extremely rich. Are you seeing that? He was extremely rich in livestock and in silver and in gold. Amen. As he goes along, he goes along. He and, so, and um, Lot, they strife. And they go their separate ways. Now, there are certain times, again, you know, when God gives you a vision or an assignment, it's not, you, you can't carry everybody with you. There are some people that don't need to come along because they may not have the faith that you have to bring this vision into the place where God wants it or to take it to the place where God wants it. For instance, here with Abraham, we saw that he took his, his nephew Lot. And it's a good thing, but he wasn't supposed to go with him all the way. That's why now there was strife and they went their separate ways. Now, when he was with Lot, there was things God could not speak to Abraham about because it wasn't for Lot to find out or to hear about. So sometimes, you know, you, God might give you a vision, but you go and ask. I remember one lady came to me one time and she says, oh, oh, Apostle, the Lord has given me a vision to start this prayer thing, you know, to start prayers in my church. And I said, okay, so why are you not starting prayers in your church? Oh, we don't have intercessory prayers. And then go ahead and start. Then she says, oh, but I went to this other lady and I asked her and she said no. And I said, and so? Well, then I'm not doing it because she, I said, did God tell you to go and start joining that other lady? She said, no. I said, what did God tell you? I said, she said, God told me to start. I said, well, then why are you going to pull in somebody who God did not tell you to pull in? You see, you have to, you know, there are people who come and mess up your stuff. In the, in the <clears throat> years that we've done, you know, ministry and in the years that we have the church, boy, oh boy, did I learn some stuff. You know, I was doing things out of compassion, giving people jobs and everything, not knowing there were bad seed coming to destroy what God was doing and to hinder the work of the Lord. Now, I had to be on my knees praying and asking the Lord for forgiveness. Lord, did you tell me to open the door for this one? Did you tell me to bring this one on board? Did you tell me to do this? And the Lord would tell me no, and I prayed, Lord, help me to get them out or uproot them because I could see where things were going in the bad direction. You know, things that had started out going well, and then all of a sudden they're going south. And I had to pray and believe God. And we, you know, I didn't want to go to people and say, oh, you, you can't be in the church. You, you can't be. But the Lord now started putting it in their hearts where they would either move away or go to a different state or whatever. But he started helping us. And so you, I learned my lesson there, just like Abraham. You don't bring everybody with you just because you know everybody. Not everybody is on the same level or wants the same thing you want or sees what you're seeing. You understand? So if the person is seeing what you're seeing, they will help you. They will stand with you. But if they're not seeing what you're seeing or going where God is sending you and you're going in different directions, it's like the oxen that, you know, the goat is going this way and the donkey is doing this thing. You see, you can't. There's a tug of war. You're unequally yoked. Amen? And so unequally yoked is not only when it comes to just relationships. It is in everything, whether it's in business. Sometimes God gives you a business idea, and you have to, you go to some, oh, I asked this person, can you join me in the business? But that's not what God said. Did God say you should get that person to join you in the business? In our ministry, people know that if you're coming to me to talk to me about business, you better not bring to me, oh, and then I'm going to ask so-and-so, is that what God said? 
If God said, bring so and so, then I will entertain it. But if God did not tell you to bring so and so with you, why are you going to start something off that they are not seeing? Their vision is not there. Your vision and their vision are not aligned. It's the same thing with marriage. You don't just marry. For me, when I, I was already in the ministry, when my husband came and I said, Lord, I don't want a husband who's not seeing where you're taking me and who's going to come in and cut off what you've, you've called me to do. You know, but sure enough, God sent a man who his vision was already in the same way that I was going. And he's never stopped me from doing anything. He doesn't even want the glory, doesn't even want to stand behind the pulpit. He knows what God sent him to do in this ministry and he does his part and he loves doing his part. You see, we don't have arguments. If Even if I tell my husband today that, oh, on Tuesday, I have to be in California, he will drop whatever he has to do, rearrange his schedule, and make sure that I'm in California on Tuesday. Why? Because he's not going to fight God about what he's called me to do. You understand? So you, are, you, you must make sure that the people in your life are aligned with the vision that God has given you. So here, Lot was not aligned with Abraham. When we're about to close, Lot was not aligned with Abraham's vision. So we go to chapter to chapter 13, and we see that now, you know, he decides to go in his own direction to Sodom and Gomorrah, and he leaves the other side for Abraham. But now I want you to see. So in verse 14, the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had left him, so there are things God might be wanting to say to you today, but there are people in your life that are hindering that word from coming forth. Because they're not, it's not that they're bad people, but they may not be, you know, supposed to be in your life at this particular time or part of whatever it is that God has called you to do, whether it's a business or whatever. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes it can even be friends. You know, you are at a place in your life where you're like, oh, praise Jesus. Now I'm with Be Healed Global Christian Church and God is doing great things. And they come and, oh, well, you know, I don't know. Oh, this, this. They say negative things to pull you down and to get you discouraged and to think, oh, my God. Yeah, maybe you're right. Oh, but they're just starting out. You know, they don't have all that many people. It's not like a big, big church. Me, I like big churches. What does it mean you like big churches? Even if there's a thousand people in here, but if you're not getting breakthroughs, what's the point? You see what I'm saying? It doesn't matter the size of the church. What matters is the word that is coming forth. Is, are you receiving meat? Are you receiving food? Is it changing your life? Because if the word that is coming forth in this place is not changing your life, then we'll shut it down. You understand what I'm saying? But if the word is changing your life, then maybe this is where you need to be. So don't be dragged away by somebody who feels that, oh, it's not a mega church. I like mega churches. Who says that we are going to say, stay the same level? No. Who told you? Were you there when God gave me the vision? <laughs> so you can't tell me this is the level where God is going to leave us. He is the one who's faithful to, who, to finish what he started. And you think God goes out small? God, God always goes out with a bang. Amen. You hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's why he said, don't you even worry about making yourself famous. I will make you. Amen. Jesus came with the same message when he would call the uh, disciples to him. He told them, stop fishing for fish. I will make you into fishers of men. The same word, I will make you. You don't have to make yourselves. We don't have to fight other churches in the area or in Dallas. Oh, geez, we would call churches to get people, steal people. No. God will bring those whom he desires to bring Amen. into this place. Amen. We don't worry about that. We worry about our assignment. Our assignment is not to try to bring people in here so the church, the chairs can all be filled. Absolutely not. The assignment is preach the word. Get the people saved. Get the people healed. Help them to find freedom in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You understand? Because once people have freedom in Christ, then it's easier for them to testify out there about, oh, now I'm free. I'm set free. I'm delivered. And others will want to come and get the freedom. It's not my job to be growing a church. It's never been on my agenda to grow a church or a ministry. I don't have the ability to do that. 
My job is to do what he's called me to do, to equip you, to empower you, to get you to the place where you are lined up with God's word and you're seeing this word manifest in your life. The promises of God, you are obtaining them. Each week you have testimony. Amen. You hear what I'm saying? Amen. That's my assignment. Not for me to be worried about, oh, let's grow the church, oh, the politics. No, I'm not interested in that. Are you hearing? Mm -hmm. So, again, it's important. So we see here, Abraham now, God speaking to him after Lot had left. Lift up now your eyes and look from the place where you are, right there where now I have brought you. He says, now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. He's telling, giving them, now you see he's already stepped out in faith. Now, at this phase, he says, now look from where you are. After Lot had left, look north, look south, look east, and look west. He says, because all the land that you see, all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your posterity forever. And I will make your descendants like the dust of the earth, so that if a man could count the dust of the earth, then could your descendants also be counted. Here's a man who has no child. And God is telling him, I, he's past childbearing age. And God is telling him, I'll make you, I'll give you descendants. You understand what I'm saying? But at this point, he says, first of all, I want you to see with your spiritual eyes. God is not asking him to see with his physical eyes. Because if he only used his physical eyes, he could just see maybe within these four walls and just see outside there and there. That's not what God was telling. He says, all the land which you see. So you have to see with your spiritual eyes where I'm taking him. He says, if you look north and you can see it, visualize it. You see, he's giving him a vision. See where I'm taking you. If you see south, see with your spiritual eyes. He see all the land there, all the land. So you see now here's when you're using your vision. You're not limited by eyesight, natural eyesight. You are now using your supernatural. You are now using the eyesight that God has given you. You see, God is telling him at this point. He says, see the land. He says, whatever it is you see. You see what I'm saying? This is where it gets interesting. Because you might be sitting here saying, oh, well, you see, um, God has told me we, to start this business here in this place. And, you know, these neighbors and those neighbors and the people that I know, you're limiting yourself. Abraham, he was being told, all the land that you see, look north, look south, look east, look west. Everything you see with your spiritual eyes, that I am committed to giving you. So God now puts the ball in his court. If you see it, I'm committed to giving it to you. What are you seeing about yourself? Because what you see about where you are at this particular point in your life, God is committed to giving you that. If you see yourself as a failure, God will give you what you see. If you see yourself as successful, God will give you the success. He says, all the land which you see. What are you seeing about your situation? What are you seeing about your marriage? What are you seeing about your children? Because you see, maybe you have rebellious children and all you see is their rebellious rebels. But what are you seeing spiritually about your children with your spiritual eyes? Do you see them succeeding? Do you see them going far in life? Because from where you are right now, when you can see your children succeeding, superseding levels, even sitting in the office of the president, when you can see your children doing exploits, God says, I will give you that which you see. Amen. 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 When you can see your marriage being a happy marriage, when you can see yourselves enjoying life, when you can see yourselves never lacking anything in your lives, never one day lacking all your bills are paid, you must see yourself debt free before you can be debt free. Amen. But if all you see is yourself defeated, God is committed to giving you what you see. He asked Abraham, he said, and it was after Lot had left. So sometimes God may want to speak to you, but there are forces hindering him because you're not positioned correctly. You need to position yourself correctly to hear from God. Lord, what is it that I need to let go of? You know, sometimes we always look at it from the aspect of people, but maybe there's things in your life. Maybe there's habits in your life that God wishes for you to get rid of. 
Are you hearing me today? There's things that might be hindering God from speaking to you. There's sin in your life. There's iniquity. There's unforgiveness. And with that, it's blocking God from speaking. But when you remove those things that are blockages, now you position yourself correctly for God to speak to you. Your antenna is tuned to heaven. It's on the right frequency. And now God can speak to you and download what he has planned for you in this next season of your life. Amen. And so he tells Abraham, look at the place where you are. From the north, from the south, from the east, and from the west. And all of the land which you see, I'm committed to giving you. Abraham had to see with his spiritual eyes land beyond where he was standing. Not what he could see with his physical eyes, but beyond seeing himself taking over his descendants, taking over all the surrounding areas. Because he knew where he was. It's not like he didn't know. So you've got to see yourself. What is the word saying about you? You want to be healed? Well, see yourself healed. And stop lining up with the word of the devil which says you're naked or you won't be healed or you'll die or this and that. All my feet are killing me. Do you want your feet to kill you? You see? You can't say things like that. You've got to line up with what God said. Oh, but the doctor said yes, but whose report do you believe? What did God say about you? He said you're the healed and not the sick. Jesus bore your sins and your sicknesses, and by his stripes, you are the healed and not the sick. You were healed. In fact, it says you were healed, past tense. So this thing that's manifesting right now, it's just the enemy trying to throw you off. You've already been healed and just take possession Amen. of your healing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you're seeing yourself sick, if you're seeing yourself dying, well, you're inviting those demonic forces to come into your life. And so God promises Abraham and he tells him, he gives them this promise and I'll give you all the land which you see and your posterity forever. And then he tells him in verse 17, I like that. He says, arise, walk through the land, the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it to you. You don't have to fight anybody, no king, nothing. Just walk. The instruction was walk through the land. What have you heard God tell you? I mean, there are times I remember when we were in the wilderness at the beginning of the ministry, the Lord tell me, get out of your car and run around the car. And we needed money. We didn't have gas money. We didn't have money. I mean, we were completely out and we didn't know what to do. We were depending on the Lord. And now I'm like, Lord, what do we do? This is the last gas that we have. Now it's on E. We don't have money for food. We don't have this. And the Lord says, get out of the car. Because I'm in the car murmuring and complaining. It says, get out. The Holy Spirit tells me, run around the car. And there I was running around the car in the middle of you know rush hour traffic in the morning. And there was a park close by. I was like, should I go there? He says, no. I said, right here, run around the car. And I'm like, people will think I'm crazy. But that's okay. They already think you're crazy. So there I was running around, running around the car. He told me specifically, run around seven times. And so I'm running around the car, running around the car. <clears throat> Excuse me. When I finished, he said, get in the car. You would think that maybe a miracle happened at that moment. But I didn't see anything. I'm like, okay. And so I kept quiet because now I'm pondering. I'm thinking, what was that running around got to do with anything? It got me to shut up. And so I got back home. And immediately upon getting back home, this lady calls me from three hours away. Woman of God, I was praying. And the Lord told me that I need to come and give you groceries. You people don't have groceries. You, your mother, your brother, and your children. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I didn't call nobody. Oh, and then he says you have no gas in your car. I'm to fill up your car with full tank of gas. And woman of God, you're going somewhere to preach. I said, girl, I don't need to go preaching right now. I need to believe God for all the money I can get. He says, well, all I know is he's instructed me to take you out and buy you clothes for you when you go preaching. I'm thinking, okay, well, she buys me the clothes. I'll take them back and get the money. The Lord told her, don't give her the receipt because she'll return it. I mean, this woman lived three hours away. I didn't call nobody. No one knew except us what we were going through. But we would cry out to God. Do you hear what I'm saying? I didn't have to ask no. He said, run around the car. So the instruction he gives you is what you run with. He told Abraham, walk. Arise and walk through the land. Walk through it. Don't just walk. Oh, now I'm tired. He said, walk through it. As you do that, I'm giving you possession of every place that you're, 
your souls are going to touch. What instruction has God given you? Has he told you to praise it? I don't feel like praising. You don't know this situation that I'm going through. It's so hard. But he said praise. Well, that's what will get you out of that situation that you're in. Has he said just worship me? Then just worship him. Has he said keep quiet? But no. Oh, devil, you, 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 devil. He did say do that. Is that what he told you to do? You've got to hear the voice of God. That's why he asked Adam, who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you should be rolling all over the floor? Who told you to be depressed? Who told you to be discouraged? What was the last thing God sent to you? So we see that Abraham goes and does what the Lord told him to do. And as we go on, you'll find in chapter 15 that now Abraham has a discussion with the Lord. And he says, Lord... I know you've said you'll give me descendants and all this, but you know, this heir is this, you know, my servant, my steward, Eliezer, and I have no child. You haven't given me a child, so what am I going to do? So in chapter 15, we see that God, you know, uh, you know, establishes a covenant with Abraham. He receives the promise of God. The Lord said to him, the word of the Lord, verse 4, came to him saying, this man shall not be your heir, but he who shall come from your own body shall be your heir. And what does he do to prove to him what he's talking about? He takes him out and he shows him the vision board that is in the air, that is out here, outside. He, said, he starts to show him the stars and he says the sand. So when it's during the night and you feel like you're discouraged, just remember what I said and look at the stars at night. And remember, let this encourage you. This is the number of descendants. If you cannot count them or if you can count them, that's how many I'm giving. Then he says, during the day when the stars are not there and you feel discouraged or depressed, look at the sand. Because if you can count the sand, that's how many descendants I'm going to give you. So God is not going to give you a vision without provision. Are you hearing? Amen. Amen. Yes. And so here he tells them that they established the covenant and I'm closing. And then in Genesis 16, 1 to 3, we see that his, his wife Sarai, she had no child. Now in all this time, when God is speaking to Abraham, Sarai is somewhere. You know, I'm assuming she's hearing, but she's more focused on her circumstances. She's more focused on her situation. Because now she comes and says, well, look, the Lord has restrained me or prevented me from bearing children. So I'm asking you to have intercourse with my maid. It may be that I can obtain children by her. And Abraham listens, like, like Adam listened to Eve. Abraham listened and heeded what Sarai said. But if he had remembered, like Peter, and he remembered what Jesus said. If Abraham had remembered what God had said, he would never have birthed an Ishmael. How many Ishmaels have you birthed in your life because you forgot what God said? What has God told you to do? Don't be like Abraham and Sarah. Because at this particular point, when now she, they did this and they birthed uh, Ishmael, it was 13 years. God did not speak to Abraham. At this time it was Abraham. 13 years, God did not speak to him because of that mistake, because he did not listen, because of disobedience, because God said he would give him a child through his own body, but with his wife Sarai. But at that point, he listened to his wife because her faith was weak. So you see, you can be married, but one person's faith is up there and the other person's faith is not. So you want to bring them up. You want to pray together. That's why prayer of agreement is important for husband and wife. If you are single, you need to find prayer partners that are strong in their faith so that when you say, add your faith to mine. You know, people are fond of saying, oh, I'm praying for you. But literally, the minute they say that, they're not doing anything. They're moving on with their own situations and circumstances. They're not going to spend time doing that for you. You know, or they might even pray one little, little prayer for you and move on. And so if you're dependent on somebody else's prayers who is not invested in your life, then, you know, you'll be sitting there thinking, oh, but you know, so-and-so is praying when they're not even praying. And you're wondering, why are things not working? Because so-and-so, sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so is praying, but yet they're not praying. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so it's so important, people of God, that you know who you are aligned with. You see, first, it's with God, and then secondly, even before you do certain things, ask God about everything. Lord, should I go this way? Lord, should I do this? Lord, should I bring this one? Lord, should I go to visit this? I do, we don't do anything without checking with God. Amen. We don't. 
The few times that I've done things without checking with God, I've learned my lesson. So believe me, we don't do anything without checking with God. Mm. Oh, absolutely not. Because if we did, then, and if we make a mistake, we're quick to go and say, okay, Lord, we misunderstood you here, or maybe we went ahead of you, forgive us. But we make sure that everything we do, I mean, you don't, every decision, we check with God. Lord, what do we do here? We pray. You see, we pray, Lord, what would we have, what would you have us do here? And so sometimes if the Lord, you know, and people say, oh, the Lord doesn't answer, sometimes it takes long, you know. No, that's not true. If your frequency is right, the only reason it might take long, like in Abraham's case, is because he sinned. So is there sin in your life? That's why maybe you're not hearing from God, because Abraham disobeyed. So if there's disobedience, there's an area where you've disobeyed God, it might take long. But all along, you see, he, whatever he did, whatever God told him to do, God would speak to him. Anyway, long story short, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 4, 18 to 22, he was called the father of faith. It took 25 years for him to have his, this child through, Isaac through him, the child of promise. And the Bible said he was fully satisfied and assured. When God gives you that word, are you fully satisfied? Are you assured that what God has said what God has told you to do, he will bring it to pass. Or are you dependent on outside forces? Are you looking based on what your eyes are telling you? Oh, it can't be done. Oh, this can't be done. Oh, that can't be done. Oh, and you're starting to put fear and, you know, fear roadblocks ahead of you. Oh, what if we, if we go this way and this doesn't work out? But that's not faith. Faith, you just step in and step out. Amen. Step in and step out. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. You just step in. God, where would you have us to go? God, where would you want us to be? If it says move, you move. If he says do this, you do this. Oh, I'm telling you, faith, you step out and you trust God. Because you, unless you're calling yourself, or unless you're telling yourself to start this thing that you're doing, then it, it's, you know, it's, it, it's going to fail if you do it yourself. But if it's God telling you to do it, it can never fail. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes. Lastly, Isaiah 55, 8 through 11, the Bible says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. My, you know, my words are, you know, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My plans are not your plans. But he says that the word that I have sent forth out of my mouth, it shall, it shall, it will not return to me void. It shall accomplish that which I sent it to do. So the word of God, you've got to depend and stand on the word of God because the word that God has spoken has to become your word. It has to become your word. His word must become your word. If God has said, like when he told Abraham, that I've given you these children, uh, these children, it had to become his word that I will have all these descendants. You understand what? It had to become his word. If anything else, if he was going to say anything else, he wouldn't have obtained the promise. Amen? Amen. Amen. Psalm 103 verse 7. Lastly. Is this blessing somebody? Hallelujah. Is this helping you? Yes. Yes. Amen. Because it needs to help you. Amen? Amen. In Psalm 103 and verse 7, it says that the Bible lets us know here. He made known his ways of righteousness and justice to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. So he made known to Moses his ways. And he also made known to Moses his acts. But the children of Israel, they only saw the acts of God. They didn't know how those miracles came by. When God's word becomes your word, when you give voice to the word of God, you will see, not only will you just see the things that God is doing, the miracles, but you will know how he will do the miracles. So when you give voice to the word of God, you will see what God said come to pass in your life. You must give voice to the word of God, which means you take that word that he has spoken and you speak it over yourself, over your marriage, over your situation and circumstances. It doesn't matter what it looks like on the outside. You take that word, you speak it. You take that word, you speak it. Even if it looks like situations are not changing. No, you take that word, you speak it. I am the healed and not the sick. I am redeemed from sickness. I am redeemed from death. You know, don't line up with the spirit of death. Oh, they said them die. No, 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 no. I cancel death in the name of Jesus. Spirit of death, you, we, we command you to go. Leave my house. You are not the will of God for me. 
lack, I command you to leave my house. Jesus said, let the poor say I'm rich. So you've got to say I'm rich. Don't start saying, oh, I don't have money. Is that what Jesus said? Oh, I don't have enough money. Oh, no, 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 no. You speak what God said. What did God say? My God shall supply all you need. Well, God is my supplier. He's my provider. He's the meter of my needs. He saw ahead and he knew that I would encounter this situation. And he's already made provision for me. Amen. And so I, I, my bills are paid in full. Even if they're pile high. My bills are paid in full. Lord, I thank you that my bills, all my bills are paid in full or canceled. I speak to debt. Debt, you are a mountain. Go in the name of Jesus. Be paid in Jesus' name. I speak to my mortgage. Be paid in full now in Jesus' name. Now, you may not see your mortgage being paid tomorrow in full. But things are happening behind the scenes. Amen. Speak to situations. Don't just sit there and agree with what Satan presents to you at his table. You are sitting at God's table. You need to partake of the Lord's table. Yes. And you need to agree with what God is saying. So if there's a contrary situation, you say what the word said. And don't move from that. I mean, even when people say, oh, but they said. Like I told that lady in Boston, I said, I don't care what the doctors come to say. That, oh, tomorrow, oh, but he's getting worse. Declare he's healed. Because that's what God has said about him. Three days, the man was discharged. Who was br considered brain dead. Three days, he came out. And to this day, when we are in Boston, he always comes with his wife. Always wanting to share that testimony. You hear what I'm telling you? So, yes. When you, when your vo when you give voice to the voice of God. To the word of God. You may, it may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, it may not be next week, but believe me, as you stand in faith, that word will come to pass. Yeah. Lastly, Isaiah 14, 24, in NLT, the Lord of heaven, uh, heaven's armies has sworn this oath. It will all happen as I have planned. Amen. It will be as I have decided. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So it's, it's his plan. We are just a part of this plan. God has his part, we have our part, and it's his plan. We focus on his plan, his way. So if it's his plan, his assignment, his vision, you go back to him. Lord, what would you have us do here? Lord, we are stuck right now. What would you have us do here? We don't know which way to go. We need direction. Lord, what would you have us do? Lord, we, we, we did this and this. We don't know if we did it right. What do we do here? How do we rectify? Always going to God. Never first going to man. Man, now look, I have people, there's those of you who come to me for counsel, and that's okay if you're not hearing from God yourselves. You've tried to hear from God and you come to me, woman of God, this is what is happening. What do I do? There are many of you right here who have testimonies of what God has done in your life after you've sought the counsel of the person God has put over your lives and you've seen things manifest in your lives. Amen. And so there's nothing wrong with that. that. In fact, we're encouraged to go to those who God has placed over us to seek counsel. You see? But it's not to go to your friends who don't even hear from God. Hmm? And that's who you go to. Eh? So, uh, sister, what do you think? What do they think? <laughs> what, ma what does it matter what they think? <laughs> Are they going to give you godly counsel? Because if they're not giving you godly counsel, it's not helping you. You're just talking to a co-worker. Let me tell you, oh, this, this, this. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, and they say, I mean, if I were you, I would do, do, do. This. People can be used of the devil. Not that they're demon, the demon possessed. But the devil can use their mouth as a mouthpiece to deliver to you something that will cause you to be out of position. Amen. So you need to check who you're sharing with. Do you know that you can have friends who are jealous of you? Oh, yeah. They'll be so jealous of you. They don't want you to prosper. And the minute you're prospering, they start coming to tell you. Huh. When you when they come to your face, huh. I'm always going, well, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I had somebody like that in my life. I had to pray them out. Every time I would share something, great God is doing this. You know, call them, hey, guess what? God is doing this. And then I'll call you back. <laughs> Some other time they'll call me, oh, guess what? Oh, they've done this for me. God, and, oh, praise the Lord. I'm happy. Oh, I'm so happy for you. Praise God. Oh, and I'll spend time listening to their testimony and sharing. 
said, you know what? This person is not a friend. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, my husband knew, minister even knew my mom. I said, I am praying them out of my life. I cried to God, Del deliver me from this person. And God did. You think I would go back there? Because I know they're jealous. And people are like that. They could even be close to you and coming to see, and they just want to see what you're doing. And then they go back out there and they place curses on you. And you think, oh, they're just my friend. All they're doing is do jealous, jealousy. That's why you don't share everything with everybody. Amen. You need to know who to share stuff with. Because some people will block it before it even starts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm telling you, you can have friends who you think, oh, these are our friends. But when God now tells you start a church, everybody goes this separate ways. You don't even hear from them. No congratulations, nothing. What, what happened? Mm -hmm. That's when you know who your true friends are. Mm -hmm. And that's when you know. You know, there's certain things I can't share with you all. You know, there's things that, oh, yeah, God is telling me. Telling me and my husband that we're praying. We've seen something, but I'm not at liberty yet to release it to you. Because some of you, maybe your faith is not there where you bring it up. But when I know that God has said, now they're ready, I can bring that word to you. You understand? Amen. Has this blessed you today? Amen. Hallelujah. To Amen. God be the glory. Amen. 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 Minister Ava, over to you now for...